Okay, while people are filing in, we're going to explain to you the, uh, you know, they've been playing spot the Fed here for, for years to out and embarrass uh, Feds. So we thought it was only uh, fair to turn it around and spot lamers. So, <laughs> so, so uh, well, that, that goes without saying. Okay, so, Priest, you want to ask the first question? Yes, sir. Who here has reenacted Monty Python's Holy Grail for fun? Wh which part? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, I forgot to tell you, you guys are voting. You guys decide who is the lamer. Okay, I'm going to take the second question, and um, I'm going to ask the number one guy down there on the end. Have you compiled your kernel today? Yes. You're a lion sack of shit. <laughs> We're not talking about corn. <laughs> okay, Rod, we're going to start that in. Oh, my gosh. Who Can you pass, pass the microphone down, please? Who am I asking the question for? The next guy in line here? Yeah, anybody. Uh, yep. Anybody. Okay, three, four. So who doesn't expect the Spanish Inquisition? <laughs> Nobody. All right. Yeah. All right. So who lives in their parents' basement? <laughs> Upstairs, okay. Oh. That counts. Who can spell their first name in uh, Leet? <laughs> go, go. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Oh, jeez. You don't get a microphone. You want me to give away my personal thoughts here? Yes. I'm not that late. Not in my Sure. Okay. Five one zero. Marcus, have you ever participated in a Star Trek marathon? <laughs> Sad. Sad. Who here didn't wait in line to buy their iPhone all night? All right, be honest. How often do you find yourself referring to enemy characters as hot? Anime. Yeah. Anime. Can the feds please articulate? Where are we next? Who am I asking the question to? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Uh, first guy at the end over there. How many external devices do you own, and how many do you have on you right now? Zero. Zero on you? Okay. All right, the Utah guy. How many how many members of the Skywalker family can you name? First family or extended? <laughs> <laughs> Get your bearings. Uh, extended family. <laughs> Okay, this is for the group. What video game was inspired by the movie War Games? Come on up, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the answer. Any, anyone? The name of the video game is called DEF CON. Everybody dies. Pass the microphone, please. Okay, just a show of hands. Who can identify who Leroy Jenkins is? No. <laughs> How many do we have in this group? Six. Ah. Which of you have all of your best friends on IRC channels. <laughs> and the last question I'm going to take, how many of you have a three-inch floppy? <laughs> all right. 
Now it's time for everybody to vote. Whoever thinks number one, raise your hand. Cheer. No? Not, not, okay. You can sit down. See ya. Raise your hand, Marcus. Marcus. Okay, you're staying. Okay, number three. Raise your hand. Okay, who's number three? Okay, I think you're a little less than Marcus, but you can stay. Number four, raise your hand, please. Who thinks number four? Yeah! <laughs> I don't want you to raise your hand. I want him to raise his hand. <laughs> Why are you raising your hand? Okay, you can go sit down. Thanks. <laughs> number five. Number six. How many want number six just to stay up here? <laughs> okay. Okay, now we're narrowing it down. Uh, for, for those new number one. Number one. N number two. Number two, take a seat. Number three. Number four. You're, you're gaining. <laughs> All right, we're narrowing it down. Number one. Number three. Marcus, you get to sit down. Number one. Number two. Okay. And you get to sit down now, honey. <laughs> All right. Congratulations to uh, number one. Thank you. Come here. Okay. What we do is we give you a uh, T-shirt. T-shirt says, meet the Fed spotted lamber. <laughs> you must wear this today. And on the back it says, Feds burn another lamer at DEF CON 16. <laughs> okay. We also had the coveted DOD Cybercrime Response Team shirt. <laughs> and if you'd start at this end and work your way down the table, everybody has something for you. He does this on Sundays also. <laughs> I'm not giving you anything else. <laughs> Air Force Cyber Command shirt. <laughs> DHS shirt. Yes, sir. NSA. <laughs> okay, we also have a uh, free ride and vacation. <laughs> He doesn't get to keep the shit either. <laughs> we'll use it again next year. 
Okay, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to uh, let everybody introduce themselves, talk a little bit about, give you a quick bio on themselves, and talk about what their agencies do. And once we finish that, then we're going to open it up to you guys for uh, questions. Now, unfortunately, there's no microphones in the audience, so what we're going to have to do is form a line right here, and I'll share my mic with you so everybody can hear. Okay? So think of the questions, and when we talk, when we when we do these questions. Don't ask big government questions because there's nobody up here that's going to be able to answer for the government. They're here representing their agencies, so kind of, you know, narrow the scope a little bit like, okay, never mind. Rod, would you like to start out? Hi, I spoke yesterday morning to most of you, so I won't take much time now. My, my name is Rod Beckstrom, and I'm the director of the National Cybersecurity Center which is a brand new organization being created within the Department of Homeland Security. That's a JV with DOD and the Director of National Intelligence to, uh, to foster situational awareness, information sharing, and collaboration across .ic, .gov, and .mil for cyber defensive purposes. And my name is Lynn Wells. I'm a uh, professor at National Defense University in Washington, and I basically teach uh, transformational things, what we want the national security establishment to look like in 10 or 15 years. And I came to this after several years in uh, Office Secretary of Defense. Rich Marshall, I wear the shirt for Jerry, first generation dad. And I've been wearing this shirt for five years when I come out here to do this thing. He knows it doesn't fit as well as it used to. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a big garage for a big car. <laughs> <laughs> Got to put on my do rag and my regular hat and my cover shirt so that you won't forget what we do. This is the the latest in our collection. <laughs> uh, my background is I was the uh, legal advisor and legal architect. Uh, for eligible receiver 97, which demonstrated to the federal government that information warfare hackers were real. And then I worked for Dick Clark. Uh, you're right. These don't fit like <laughs> uh, You guys are lucky they're going on. <laughs> <laughs> helped uh, develop the uh, national cyber search security strategy that all of you love and endorse. My name is Randy Vickers. I'm the Deputy Director of U.S. CERT. Um, my background is, uh, prior to uh, coming to the U.S. CERT, I ran the uh, uh, DOD CERT. And uh, probably the most claim to fame to that was when we blocked MySpace and YouTube across the dot mill. Uh, quite popular thing. Um, uh, currently, uh, with the U.S. CERT, uh, we are a, a national asset to help the dot gov and state and local uh, defend the networks uh, across the federal government, as well as collaboration and coordination with uh, uh, other partners to include uh, international and uh, law enforcement partners. Uh, Mike Witt, I'm with uh, your Internal Revenue Service. Uh, quick show of hands real fast. How many here uh, have got their stimulus checks back? How many received two? I need to see you. <laughs> Uh, prior to coming to IRS, I uh, spent uh, five years with the startup of uh, U.S. CERT, and uh, so a little background in that. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Colonel Mike Convertino, U.S. Air Force with Air Force Cyberspace Command. Uh, been in Great the commercials, eh? There you go. <laughs> that was for that you. stuff's real, by the way. <laughs> um, I've been in the Air Force 17 years with uh, assignments and NSA, as well as the Air Force and other agencies. Um, doing things of probably of great interest to you, very similar to things to you, to things that you do. So uh, I've been to DEFCON eight times, first time in '94. Um, I really enjoy it every time I come. So should be a lot of a lot of fun here on the panel. So look forward to your questions. Hello, my name is Mark Morrow. I'm, no, he wanted me to speak in French, but if you have any questions in French, I can answer them after the session. We can do that after. Yes. 
So I'm with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, I've been with them for 29 years. I've been investigating uh, computer crime since about 92, then uh, over to the uh, Canadian Police College as a course coordinator, and now I'm in charge of uh, policy and standards for all of the investigators in Canada with the RCMP. Uh, our group has about 145 people in uh, technological crime in Canada with our organization. That doesn't include other police services. And uh, looking forward to answering, answering your questions. Hi, my name is Barry Grundy. I'm a supervisory special agent with the NASA Computer Crimes Division. I know the tag says NASA, but I'm actually part of the NASA Inspector General's office. Um, we're a law enforcement agency uh, uh, tasked with the oversight of NASA. And uh, primarily the Computer Crimes Division uh, does intrusion investigations. That's, that's basically what we do. And um, general computer forensic support for uh, general crimes. Um, pretty small unit. Uh, there's, I supervise the east of the Mississippi, about nine NASA centers, and I have four agents and two techs, and we stay pretty busy, um, mostly with intrusions, as you can imagine. That's it. My name is uh, David Helfman. I'm a special agent with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service for the last three years. Uh, before that, I was... How many of you like the TV show? <laughs> um, rock on. Um, <laughs> I play golf with him every Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and uh, I work for the Atlantic Cyber Division for NCIS. Uh, basically what we do is uh, computer intrusions. Me specifically, that's pretty much all I work on now, uh, trying to protect the assets of the Department of Defense, specifically Department of Navy. Hi, my name is Ray Kesnick. I'm the director of the Defense Cyber Investigative Training Academy, which is a component of Defense Cyber Crime Center. I'm also an NCIS special agent detailed to DCITA as a director, 22 years with uh, NCIS. And I know you don't play Tuesday afternoons because I play Tuesday morning with Mark Harmon. Very busy schedule. He uh, acts our advice on a regular basis. So if you have any questions, please ask. Hi, I'm Jim Finch, the Assistant Director for the FBI Cyber Division, and I'm responsible for all of the FBI cyber resources and it's in its 56 field offices across the country. We investigate uh, computer intrusions, both of a national security nature and criminal, as well as online sexual exploitation, investigation of intellectual property rights violations, and then there's a lot of outreach that goes along with that uh, through programs like InfraGuard and uh, our IC3 Internet Crime Complaint Center, uh, which we take complaints for victims who have uh, used the Internet, feel like they've been defrauded or their systems have been compromised, they call IC3. And hopefully we will address that. If we don't address it, we'll send it to the state and locals who do. Uh, we also uh, do outreach in a lot of other areas in the intelligence community, but that's stuff that's probably not of interest to you. But we work with each of these agencies on computer intrusions as well as uh, many of our international partners because of the nature of the Internet. That's it. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> Okay, I'm Jim Christie, and uh, if you got questions, if you'd start forming a line right here, you know, otherwise this concludes this panel. <laughs> uh, my name's Jim Christie. I'm a retired special agent with the uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigation. It was assigned to uh, Defense Cyber Crime Center for the last uh, seven or eight years. I'm the director of Futures Exploration. And those of you that don't know DC3, our mission, we had the world's largest accredited digital forensics lab, about 100 forensic examiners. We have the, the best uh, uh, training academy that Ray Kesnick runs, uh, where we train the uh, uh, criminal and counterintelligence investigators in the Department of Defense. And we have an institute that does the uh, research and development of tools as well as the testing of tools that are used in a uh, uh, forensics lab. Okay, first question. Where's the uh, Jeopardy music? Come on, need a victim here. All right. As far as it gets. Here. Representing 10% of the population that's here, how many of you work with women, have women supervisors, and have opportunities for women in your fields? <laughs> and if 
Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, uh, Michelle Kwan, the director of the U.S. CERT, was here and did Black Hat and got called back home. Uh, so Randy is filling in for her. Anybody else want to take those questions? Cheryl has mentioned our deputy director of the NCSC. It's free on your Okay, next question. Thank you. This question is for the colonel. Uh, with the relatively new threat of malicious software embedded into uh, networking hardware, how does Air Force Cyber Command intend to ensure control of its secure networks with insecure components? Oh. <clears throat> that, that, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Next question. <laughs> that's a, I can tell you, but then I'd have to bomb you. Um, well, I, obviously, we have other uh, other measures to make sure. Obviously, the the, the war fighting network, the, the network under on which we uh, conduct the command and control of the Air Force itself and all its war fighting equipment, hardware, um, is a segmented network. It's a it's a wholly separate, and so things getting in and off of it are only uh, through human, uh, human buffoonery. So um, <clears throat> we we have a lot of measures to try and. Preclude that, um, but there have been on and off uh, incidents in the past which we've handled uh, pretty pretty carefully. Um, we don't we, obviously uh, with new technology and new, new issues, supply system issues, which is what you're getting at. Um, we uh, we have we are in the process of developing additional measures to prevent exactly that from happening. So, um, if I were to describe them to you, you know that that would be a uh, a faux pas, so I, I won't do that here. Um, but uh, but, but if you'd like a beer that, later, he'll do it. For that's you. right <laughs> for a beer. <laughs> but uh, rest assured that we've we've got that pretty well in hand, um, and we're improving our security every day as well. So, anybody else on the panel want to take that for their agency? I didn't think so. <laughs> Hi, first of all, I want to say, um, if you guys run out of questions, it's kind of intimidating to walk up here and, and talk about it. So you might want to just have them shout it out. But anyway, um, that being said... Is that English? <laughs> that being said, my question is, um, if... Uh, if someone discovers something like a vulnerability or something in one of that uh, is applicable to one of your departments, is there first of all is there a centralized place that they can go to report it without having to post it on Slashdot where everyone can exploit it? Secondly, is there a way to fast track and get past all the government bureaucracy and really um, have attention paid to it? Uh, see me after for uh, we'll talk about a free Navy lunch. You can all come see me after. I'll be here all night. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, In the microphone, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's like Congress. <laughs> yeah, everything's recorded. One of the things that we always have to, to, to take the challenge is how we share information because information is being shared about uh, weaknesses in our environment. So. Uh, one of the first things as you look at your incident handling or someone looks at the incident handling process is how you do the reporting. And at a minimum, you've got to report to your uh, security operations center or equivalent type organization that can uh, gather enough information to be able to do a mitigation strategy and execute that. Now, the rapid response to that and share that information is one of the things that uh, uh, we at U.S. CERT does. So as we get information, uh, whenever that information comes in, we do uh, a similar activity on a much larger scale. And even before, and our goal is hopefully before it starts affecting other organizations, we're taking the mitigation strategy that was used and sharing that with other organizations. And as it becomes more widespread, we reach out to other partners uh, to look at more uh, extensive type mitigation strategies and we post those, whether it be on our, our website or we push that to uh, other organizations. And we also learn that 
uh, as we start sharing that information that we're seeing it, you know, that activity is probably happening in other places as well. Anybody else? As far as just reporting at least the, uh, an incident, I think it's important. If you call your local police service of jurisdiction, uh, hopefully you will know who that is, and at least they will be able to point you in the right direction, I would like to think. Um, I know that uh, with the RCMP, you go to the website and you can find out the technological crime section and get a telephone number there. Uh, start at least. I know that uh, sometimes it can be, it's well, we're with the government, so you might think it's a little slow, but at some point, some Somebody will be able to give you the right information, I'm sure. Might take a few phone calls, but hang in there. I think it's very important, at least, that somebody does step forward and report it. For the FBI, if you report it to any of my people and it's published on Slashdot, let me know. I want to find out how it leaked out. But that's one of the things I like to keep very close to the vest because we, we hope we can develop a relationship with the public that uh, they will have some degree of trust when it comes to reporting things like that that will benefit the users as a whole. And I have, I have yet to see anything reported to my people that was then published as a result of it leaking from my organization. Now, it could have leaked from places where it was uh, reported that are not within within the FBI, but if you report it to one of the 56 field offices, I guarantee you it shouldn't be published on Slashdot or anywhere else because I want to pursue that investigation and I, I can't I can't do that or we can't do that if information is leaking out. So um, feel free to report it to us and uh, hopefully it will be maintained in complete in complete confidence. If not, uh, certainly, I'm in Washington. Give me a call. Number is 202. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Not, not yeah, let me just, uh, on the internet. just one point on this is that even if you have a centralized location, uh, and most of us do in some respects, uh, it's only a part of the problem. Uh, Lou Gerstner, who used to be the CEO at uh, IBM, uh, was in a symposium one time and he asked, how do I know if I have an effective information assurance program? And so the answer was, walk down the hall, find a random employee, and ask them three questions. Would you know if your computer was being uh, screwed with? If yes, would you know who to call? If yes, would you care enough to call? And the point was, unless you can answer yes for all three member or for, to all three questions for every member of your organization, you can spend a gazillion bucks in technology and you're not going to get the answer because it'll fail in the people piece. So in addition, most of us have these, but it's incumbent on us to train our people to make use of them and particularly to understand what's going on. So it's not just simple as having the, uh, the phone number. Thanks. Okay. Hey Jim, will this will this mic work better for them? I'm sorry, will this mic work better for yeah, them? Sure. Yes. Uh, since you all have um, very, uh, you, you all, all all your jobs overlap to some extent. So, and since you all feed off the same trow, except for the Mountie, uh, do you guys believe there's any infighting amongst yourselves? <laughs> Answer is no. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> this one goes to the entire panel. Um, obviously, you're all from very different departments, and I'm kind of curious as how all of you got involved with the work you're doing. Uh, did you come from predominantly um, technical backgrounds into the fields you're working in, or um, were these like predominantly military backgrounds that became technical? I'll, start that I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah, I was I was I was in New York in 9/11 and had a really powerful personal experience and. Ended up uh, actually working for Peace all over the Middle East for three and a half years, building a decentralized network of CEOs organized in a cell-like format. And out of that, uh, co-authored a book called The Starfish and the Spider, and then uh, was actually asked to uh, help out the government and uh, to help be an advisor to the director of national intelligence. 
and then got pulled into the cyber effort. But I've, I've done tech companies for 25 years. It's my first time in the government. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to serve. And as you, as you all know, cyber defense is very, very difficult. And we've got to really think about the models that we use for doing this. So in my, in my case, I'm not from a federal government background. I'm from a private sector, high-tech uh, CEO and starting companies background and a lot of nonprofit work. So I'm a new kid on the block, but I, I, there's a lot of opportunities in government, and we need people like you to, to come and get involved. And my background is career military, particularly Navy. Uh, but my interest has been the intersection of policy and technology. And so I was happily working in the Undersecretary for Policy's office in the late, mid, mid to late 90s when someone said, there's this thing called encryption policy. Would you like to talk about this? Or would you like to get involved in this? Well, anyway, that's what sort of got me involved in this, led to eligible receiver 97, Rich. And so uh, I sort of got into it serendipitously, but I uh, really enjoyed it. And I second what, uh, what Rod said. There's enormous amounts of talent out here in this room. Uh, if you want to have a chance to work on issues that are uh, historic, greater than yourself, uh, as long as you sort of haven't crossed a line into felony behavior, <laughs> we would love to have you. Uh, and, How uh, many uh, have felony behavior? <laughs> 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 There, there is a website called firstgov.gov that will lead you down to any uh, job office to open the federal government. And I just encourage you, if you're interested, to take a look at uh, applying for those. I don't have a technical background at all. It took me four years of college to complete two semesters of physics, so you can tell I'm working upstream. Uh, I have a postdoctorate in international and comparative law, which you know prepares me adequately for what I'm doing. Uh, the neat thing was when I was the associate general counsel and was charged with helping out to develop some legal techniques for con doing computer penetration testing, I had kind of this weird notion as a lawyer that it might be helpful if I understood what my clients were doing. And the approach I took was you need to make sure I understand what you're doing sufficiently. Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Make sure I understand what I need to hear so that if things go bad, I'm an unindicted co-conspirator with you. You know, we go to jail together, I just don't come and visit you. That's a pretty powerful message. And so I sat down with quite a few hackers, learned some very interesting techniques, got behind it, and they were extremely gifted in explaining how things work. And uh, it was an amazing epiphany. And I've just been in love with it ever since. It's just been absolutely phenomenal. And the kind of work that you're doing on the legal side is absolutely critical to making sure that our systems continue to work. So thank you for the good things that you're doing. I had a similar background. I started out as a, uh, uh, an infantry officer in the United States Army and decided I kind of liked this computer thing long before networks when we still had rotary dial phones and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, but not cards for, you know, for programming. <laughs> not quite that far back. Uh, but, um, uh, the Army, in its infinite wisdom, decided to uh, send me to grad school and, uh, and send me to an organization where I got to work with public key uh, infrastructure and then realized that uh, though fun, it uh, wasn't where the rubber met the road and started working in, uh, with computer emergency response teams in Europe and uh, the DOD and then uh, solved the challenges of the federal government uh, because of the challenge of uh, defense versus offense. Uh, defense is much harder and a greater challenge, so uh, since I can't be one of the cool kids like you, uh, I wanted to, you know, try to do what I can to do the operations piece, and that's where my passion lies, and so that's why I'm where I'm at. Uh, I was actually started out as a system administrator and network administrator in uh, the Department of Defense and found myself actually uh, in Eligible Receiver 97, uh, as uh, one of the um, people involved in the exercise. Uh, from there, I moved over to an organization in the Department of Defense called ASSIST. It's DOD, so you've got to have an acronym for everything. So ASSIST uh, later became uh, renamed uh, the DOD CERT. And uh, I actually, uh, within my first six months there, was involved in a couple of things called Solar Sunrise and Moonlight Maze. So from there, that's kind of where I kind of got my start from that. 
Well, even though I'm the military guy on the stage, the active military guy on the stage, I, I guess it, it sounds like I'm the most similar to some of you, although some of my stuff, uh, the way I started, was a little probably dated, but uh, some of you. Um, I was really interested in telephones when I was really young. Um, just put it that way. <laughs> uh, <Joe Martin. laughs> Yeah, I had a lot of uh, girls, uh, friends that I like to call that were far away from my house. You know, I met them at camp and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, just, you know, things to facilitate that. That's how it started off and then went on to Heath kits and all sorts of neat stuff like that. So I guess that makes me more like you than a lot of the folks here in the military thing. I only came into it much later as a way to really pay for college. You know, um, I actually have an electrical engineering degree and a master's in uh, uh, computer engineering. So I got, I'm also the big geek on the stage, I guess, too. So anyway, but that, that's mo mostly about me. I, after uh, after entering the military, like I said, I, I, I continued the same uh, activities, uh, but uh, sanctioned under the, the federal government. So so <laughs> it is a good way of life if you can if you can you know get it. So, <laughs> but we are, of course, always recruiting, as you know from our commercial. So, uh, and I'm a proof positive that you can get into the military, um, you know, as long as, again, you haven't actually committed any of those felonies, or at least nobody can prove it, right? <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> With regards to myself, uh, having said earlier that I had 29 years service, I can say that I was one of the guys way back when in college when they had the uh, programming in basic and the punch card. So I go back that far. Uh, having done that, I've always been interested in computers, um, but I did general investigations for the first five or six years. Uh, then the opportunity came where I could get into the field of technological crime, and I lived through the years of the uh, bulletin board systems. Uh, that was a lot of fun, a lot of investigations on that side. Then I said, I mentioned before, moved over then to the, as a course coordinator to the Canadian Police College, and now on, on the management side, uh, looking after the uh, policy and standards for a national program for all of our investigators across Canada. I'll keep it real brief. I, the, the original question about you know what, what got us up here, I, I think the key word that you hear again and again is passion. If you really like this stuff, you can do it. Um, I started out as an infantryman in the Marine Corps. I had no technical knowledge at all until I went to college, uh, got into computers, and luckily right off the bat started using Linux and Unix uh, instead of the DOS Windows stuff, and that gave me a little bit of a niche. And, uh, and that's where it went from there. But it, it's the passion that drove it. If you really like doing this stuff, you can, you can go, go wherever you want. And I, I imagine being here at DEF CON, most of you are in that same category. Yeah, I think as I mentioned, I, uh, I started out at Cisco Systems. Um, I was kind of a geek. Uh, still am. Um, I just started going to grad school about five years ago. I was just looking for something different to do. Took some classes. Uh, based on the nature of the, the program, I was ex exposure to law enforcement for the first time, and it was just something that um, hit on right away and said, maybe I missed my calling. So I started dropping applications, and NCIS was lucky enough to get me first. So there you go. A lot of smart guys up here. Anyway, 29 years of law enforcement, um, I decided I liked putting bad guys in jail and figured out several years ago that um, there are a lot of smart cyber guys out there, so I decided I need to get smart on that, moved along through the field, and uh, that's how I got where I'm at. I think my story is more of the passion side. Started out in college as a uh, comp sci major when Fortran, Cobalt, Assembler, Pascal were all required courses. and. Uh, Ended up getting recruited by IBM my last year of college. Uh, spent some time there and ended up in the FBI somehow. And I've just never lost that passion. Love Unix or flavors of Unix. And I'm usually running about four or five operating systems at home and on four or five different computers. And it's just a passion. And I work around a lot of people with that same passion. And so that's why I'm here. And that's why I actually paid to get, I think, 12 or 13 people here as well, because this is what we enjoy. It's what and we do. And they could do. be sitting right next to you. <laughs> 
I guess I got into the field uh, just by luck. Uh, back in 71, I was in school, and um, I didn't have enough credits to keep my student deferment, and I wound up flipping the lottery. You know, you guys remember the draft, and you guys don't even remember the draft. So I uh, joined the Air Force very quickly, and uh, luckily they made me a computer operator system administrator. And then uh, after, uh, I guess, about uh, eight years of that, I cross-trained, uh, took a downgrade, became a programmer, working Fortran, COBOL, you know, assembler, you know. And then uh, uh, I was bored to tears. I was writing the parking control program for the fucking Pentagon. <laughs> So I that started, went well, Jim. So I started looking for a job, and I had a, uh, I got an opportunity uh, to become a computer crime investigator with uh, Air Force OSI. And I said, wow, you mean uh, I get to stay with technology and carry a gun? Wow, they, these guys aren't really bright. You know, they could use me. So I um, went over to OSI and became the chief of computer crime for uh, the Air Force OSI for about 11 years. And uh, just love it. So next question. Draft, damn your own. Uh, so, my question is: uh, it, it, it may sound uh, slightly broad, but I try to be narrow. <laughs> anyway, so um, as far as I understand, the very presence of government agencies on such a kind of event it it means like appreciation of the work being done by uh, independent specialist, but I would really like to know, uh, not to know, but get recommendation or recommendations from officials, from f federal officials, uh, what's this, how to avoid the borders between uh, research and something which is not anymore research, which can be treated as a crime already. Something that happened to Sklarov Sergei in like uh, this meeting like five years, 2001, or something that happened with Robert Morris when he wrote his worm and it just escaped the cage. Speech or what? <laughs> what country are you from? Uh, me? Uh, Russia? No, I'm talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just asked what could no, be the... No, what country are you from? Uh, Russia. Okay. So, so that's, that's the question. <laughs> Just, just recommendations from from people. Uh, we'll think about it. <laughs> Anybody want to take that one? What was the question? Sounds like your kind of question. Read Title 18, U.S. Code uh, 1030. Even better. I'm a, a strong advocate of the Lawyer Full Employment Act. So get a good lawyer. Get a good, smart lawyer and talk to them and listen to them and pay them up front. Did you have a card? He said smart lawyer. <laughs> That's why he's here. He's, he's, he's on every panel. I'm just joking. Next question. Uh, many of us in information technology security uh, feel like our entire lives are under constant siege. Uh, at work, our systems are exploited. Our companies often don't have the resources to protect us. Um, at home, you know, social engineering from our peers or people we happen to talk to, social engineer their way into our lives. Uh, personally, women are often have the feeling they're running around with a target on their back because people want to see just exactly how good we are. Um, do you also have this experience of having your entire lives uh, exposed to, you know, the government investigations, which we do, we do, you know, uh, running afoul through our in-map scanning and, and following back some of our things, and as well as uh, just as a matter of protecting yourselves, and how do you deal with that impact into your life? Uh, I would say we probably feel the same way as you from that standpoint. There's a term that we use in the government, and God we trust, everyone else we polygraph. And that's pretty much how it is for, from our standpoint of, of being you know, a federal employee of what we do from, from that and what we have to go through to protect our networks to ensure that uh, our public services that we provide back to you, the taxpayers, are there, they're protected, and they're there for your services. 
Surprisingly enough, my agency doesn't have that problem. <laughs> Anybody else want to take that? Hi. As a government employee, especially when we get clearances, you're, you're, you're back, you have no secrets anymore. You know, and, and, and like Mike said, you know, polygraphs, part of that, background investigations that take forever and cost a lot of money. Uh, you know, you, there are no secrets. Hey, Next Jim, question. Jim, let me, uh, just, just I want to go back to address this with the passion that a lot of us have talked about. I mean, one never comes to a convention like this and goes home feeling better from an information security point of view. I mean, the, the enthusiasm, the energy, and the uh, ingenuity that you all display out there always comes out with some kind of thing that causes those of us who are in the defend business to, to have to work harder. Uh, and yet it's that passion about this for you know, protecting not just government secrets for the purpose of secrets, but for the be able to um, uh, you know, promote what we hope is the betterment of the American people's uh, uh, livelihood. Uh, that uh, keeps us going. So I think, uh, yeah, we see a target on ourselves all the time. I think most of us go home and look at our own home networks uh, and say, geez, you know, what are the problems we're going to have personally if something happens? And then go back and try to do it again because uh, you know, there is no answer to this. You never cross the goal line, never get to spike the football. Uh, and it's that passion that keeps people going. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I have a lot of empathy with what you shared. I think it's a challenge for all of us in this new world of, you know, incredible potential transparency. And I also want to recognize that all my colleagues here to the left uh, and myself have kind of signed up for a program where we've given up, you know, a lot of our privacy in some, some fashion. In fact, when I had to make the decision to, to step up and serve the government and do this, it was one of the hardest parts of the decision is to go from being a completely private citizen to saying I'm willing to go through just incredible, you know, unlimited uh, background checks, et cetera, to, to come and serve the government at the time as a volunteer, as an advisor. Um, and uh, so I think that for some of the federal employees, it's even more challenging than for individual citizens because we have all the same threats from hackers and everything else going on. Plus, we have signed up to uh, a level of responsibility that we have and, and openness. So uh, I think it's a, a common challenge uh, we all face, and I think everyone in the federal government is, is very sympathetic. And uh, I think you probably took a significant cut in pay as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sure. Okay. I don't know. I'm a short guy. <laughs> um, we're probably living in, in, in one of the most profound revolutions that have taken place since the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things I've seen in, in the business world is there's a constant need to change your models and uh, your preconceptions. What do you guys see in terms of what new models and what new preconceptions do your agencies have to uh, adopt or endorse? Question. Start down to right. I'll, I'll take a stab. There's quite a few, and I think, and I, I spoke to some of this yesterday. How many people were there yesterday morning? Okay, oh, a few. Okay, then I'm not repeating too much. Um, but in talking about looking at the cyber challenge, which is an incredible challenge, and I liken cyber to basketball, and said, you know, if a high-scoring basketball game might be 113 to 99. In cyber, the score would be 113 million to 99 million, uh, uh, perhaps, because offense is so much easier than defense. Okay, And so then the question becomes, how do you change the odds? How do you change the rules of that game? How do you change the dynamics of the system? And, and I think I've probably got more questions for you than I've got answers. But clearly, one of the things we've got to look at is the protocols of the network themselves, the BG, whether it's BGPSAC or DNSSEC. But how do we rewire the system and really make the investments there? It's like the ounce of medicine that's, that's a lot cheaper than a pound of cure or a million pounds of cure. But I think we've got to really think about where do we want to take this network where do we want to end up in 5, 10, or 20 years? And how do we steer and tighten up the protocols at every level to make it a much more secure environment? 
I think another uh, area for us to look into, and, and, and the community can help us here, but is how can, you, how can we integrate privacy and security uh, and, 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 and adherence and support for appropriate law enforcement? And there's, a, there's people out there in the community who think that those can be well integrated through anonymous uh, services, for example. Uh, and I think it's a, a challenge and an opportunity for us collectively to work on that and, and think through it. But I think that's part of the, the, one of the pillars we've got to take a look at. So, so three areas that are of concern to us right now. Uh, one is the ability to share information, uh, to communicate, collaborate, translate, perhaps, and engage with civil military partners outside the boundaries of the Defense Department. And the point is, unless you can effectively engage with these uh, folks, you can't achieve the social, the political, and the economic goals which the military was committed in the first place. This is not a nice-to-have adjunct to the kinetic phase of warfare. It's got to be a core part of the strategic thinking from the beginning. So how do you do that? How do you protect, on the one hand, uh, things that need to be protected, at the same time encourage people to be thinking about how to share with the uh, people who are working with you from business, government, and civil society to get the broader mission done? Uh, the second piece, uh, there's a very interesting initiative uh, called S3, which is Social Software for Security. And if any of you take a look at Mashable.com uh, the last uh, week, there have been two posts on this, uh, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, by a guy named Mark Drapo. Uh, over the past uh, couple uh, weeks, we've been able to put together over a 1,000 different instantiations of social software. Uh, and the main point here is not is to understand how the government can make use of the incredible energy out there on the in the private sector. Uh, we're here with an acquisition system that will deliver by the second quarter of fiscal year 2010 some kind of a program. In the meantime, you guys are turning things in weeks. So how do we find a way to responsibly capture the energy and make use of it? Because there are lots of other people who may be you know, wishing us ill who are out there taking use of it. And the third point, uh, which goes, I, I take the point in anonymous behavior, but the issue of identification and authentication from a long-term sort of macro defense of the network and attribution of who's out there trying to attack us on a nation-state basis uh, is a critically important factor we've got to find a way to work on. So thank you. I think, I think one of the things that we have to first look at is we have to understand our environment. Our environment has changed, and I you know, alluded to the, the, the rotary phone and all these other things, and what was a network and what is a network today and, and the speed at which things do. If you use uh, an infantry analogy of uh, uh, infantry warfare, it's, it's, it hasn't changed since the first person picked up a club and uh, you know, attacked his neighbor over food. The thing that changed is the speed and distance at which it's executed. So if we keep fighting Napoleonic Wars with modern technology, all we do is annihilate each other. If you take the same uh, approach with, uh, uh, with what we do, is we have to understand the environment and how it works. We have to go from uh, securing physical devices on our network to securing the data, the intellectual capital that we're wanting to preserve. Uh, and unfortunately, that hasn't, you know, been accepted all the way across. We're starting to do more of that, but you've got to do everything from labeling types of data and doing stuff. So there's paradigm shifts in how we execute the technology to prevent certain things. It's not just about another, you know, device that we put somewhere in line to do some other type of, of thing. So you have to look at the difference between the infrastructure, and you, you have to understand what your mission is to be able to defend and work your mission so you, you, you've got to take it looking at the risk management piece. From a security perspective, risk management is the weakest thing. You don't know how to define the return on the investment. And we have to better articulate that to be able to, uh, be able to put the proper mitigation out. Sometimes you leave something open because the risk uh, is, worth, uh, is worth it because the cost to implement something is too high. But that has to be done, and we don't do that well. So one of the things that we have to do is start doing better risk management and, and risk structure. So it's just understanding the environment and changing with the environment and not uh, uh, sitting, as, as Dr. Wells said, of going the acquisition strategy that takes five, ten years to implement uh, a change. Well, that goes way with policy and, and everything we do. Hey, if you guys don't talk, you lose your microphone. 
Thank you. I would like uh, each panelist to offer an answer. Should only count for a couple of words each. Um, so, what organization or entity, state or non-state, foreign or domestic, do you currently regard as the greatest threat to your organization? And if you can't do that, if that's too touchy, just say category of actor. We'll start at this end. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> We've certainly identified certain countries as threats. Uh, we have those, and clearly we've identified those as physical threats and technology threats. I won't go into the Middle East. I won't go into Eastern Europe or Asia, anything like that. What I will tell you is we have categorized them quite well. Barry says uh, you had two words, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> But what would you like? Would you would you like uh, the number of the number of uh, alpha alpha characters in that country? Huh? Canada. <laughs> but no, there there are probably at least five countries we've identified as as having skills equivalent to the U.S.'s, and, and so they are certainly a concern. I can't tell you that. Come on. All right. Greatest threats other than the FBI. Um, <laughs> be five letters. Starts with a C. Chili? That's chili. <laughs> Real brief, I'm going to swap that around and say uh, one of the threats that we, we do suffer uh, is an insider threat. And I, I think everybody knows that's kind of a... a normal thing to say, but if, yeah, if, uh, if we could educate people inside to not make themselves so vulnerable, we wouldn't be victims so often. Without getting into the specific number of uh, countries, uh, somebody mentioned five, and I guess that's uh, probably very close. C -A -N -A. <laughs> I, actually, uh, I, I think uh, the reason I, I would say nation states, but I but I think that there's a reason for that, and, and that's deeper than that, and that is uh, the lack of concentration. You know, th this room is full of people that are an exception to to a growing rule in the United States, where where people are not getting as much technical training as they should. Um, when I went to uh, to college and went to engineering school, I was a minority uh, in that school as far as uh, nationality, believe it or not. And, uh, and that's only getting more so. So if you're, if you're asking the United States military what it thinks is actually the single greatest threat is uh, a failure of American youth in some cases to go out and get properly educated or be properly motivated to do the things that all the people in this room enjoy doing so much. Anyone but me. Kind of a, an extension of uh, Barry's comments, and I think it's the inconvenienced user. Uh, it's a different type of insider's threat. It's the one that says, uh, uh, when that pop-up says, do you want to do X, instead of thinking through, you know, first of all, it shouldn't pop up, but it, it's um, it clicking, yeah, it's a feature. Uh, it's <laughs> clicking on that and, uh, you know, causing others. So it's the inconvenience user or the user that's doing things more innocuously, uh, not the one that's doing things more nefariously. <laughs> Biggest threat, three words. Unknown, undocumented features and software. I personally think we underestimate the threat posed by organized crime. Uh, but what really bothers me is the patient, sophisticated, uh, long-term insertion of malicious code, uh, either through supply chains or through uh, you know, penetrations, insider or outsider, uh, that lay the conditions for you know, who knows what at some point in the future. And that's one of the real differences between the cyber problem and others is you don't know whether someone's just screwing around and taking, uh, you know, manipulating data for the hell of it or they're actually putting in uh, code that can be executed later on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where my concern is. I think the greatest threat is the failure of our own imagination. 
to re restructure and re-engineer and direct the whole system to to a better end state. And I think this is an amazing nation. And I have tremendous respect for the whole world, and I've lived overseas several times. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is the most important infrastructure in the world today, the Internet. It's what binds us. It what makes, it's what's, what makes us interdependent, allows us all to communicate and to build a global society. And we really need to think, think about where we want to take this thing. And it's always easy to rip things apart, and it's much more difficult to design them and choose where we want to take them forward. So I hope that we can all collaborate in that effort. Next question. Does the U.S. Air Force still feel that we need a uh, military botnet? <laughs> you know, I called that guy after he said that stuff, you know, and I asked him what the heck he thought he was doing. Um, uh, you know, that, that to me, that's, that's a non-elite way to do things, in my opinion. Um, it, it isn't, uh, to me, a professional manner in which we were to conduct our craft. So, no, I kind of I, I kind of sneer at that. Let's just put it that way. I, that, that wasn't an Air Force position. That was a particular colonel position. Uh, I was just wondering what you guys look for in recu recruits or just uh, some new technology maybe that you guys look for? I'll, I'll take the first. Trainability, willing to learn, and willing to work hard. Um, and can get a clearance. <laughs> yes. Um, because those that are, that are uh, compassionate about the job and really care are going to take that extra step to do the right thing day in and day out. And, uh, you know, having, you know, 15 degrees, 35 certifications, yeah, that's great, uh, get you into the, into the door, but uh, you've got to be able to work the, the hard hours and the, and the time to, uh, to want to defend the, the things that we hold most dear. I'll just add on to that. I think you kind of got it from the other panelists up here is, Passion. Those that are passionate about doing the the mission of what we do, and so if that's the people we're looking for, that is the people that we're seeking to find, and also pass a tax audit as well. And you have to be uh, actively seeking a pay cut in many cases as well. <laughs> One of the things I'd like to throw out there as well is uh, for anybody that was looking for a job in today's society, uh, people that are applying, actually that open source uh, is available to everybody. As somebody mentioned before, the use of the Internet is available to everybody. Uh, so I don't think it's a surprise to anybody here that a lot of the companies, uh, whether it's law enforcement or any other type of company, they do use that open source to try to find out some of the backgrounds. And I, again, I don't need to be telling anybody here that is using a lot of the Facebook. Uh, a lot of that stuff does come up. So again, uh, yes, getting security clearance is paramount if, you're, if you want a job uh, with law enforcement, I guess. Uh, one word, and that's sacrifice, I think. You know, sacrificing uh, uh, the good salaries that you guys might be making out there compared to what we make up here, uh, willing to work long hours, uh, those kinds of things. Um, my question's a little bit more uh, uh, just in general, but for each agency, um, I'm curious, just your opinions. Um, there's a lot of talk, uh, and it comes, you know, especially through the media, but uh, balancing um, privacy and anonymity and things like that versus the transparency for, for law enforcement to look into citizens' lives and to, you know, investigate data and mine data and harvest data and, and, and compile it all and, and, and keep databases on people. And how do you guys each feel in your agencies about how, that, uh, how you have to balance that? And, and is privacy something that you guys think about? Out when you're when you're performing investigations, and is that something that comes up a lot, or is it something that you feel that gets in your way, and and you um, you're looking for more transparency? How, how do you guys think about that? Hey Jim, start at that end. I'm going to give you an honest answer to that question. I don't think there is any entity in the world that is more concerned about individual privacy and protecting that than the NSA. Any program that is conducted is rigorously reviewed independently by different lawyers to make sure everything is done correctly. 
And I can tell you from personal experience, I've worked for several of the directors, if the lawyers don't endorse it, it doesn't get done, period. I was just going to add that uh, I don't know if some people here are aware, but uh, in Canada we just had a, uh, a recent policy uh, implementation from uh, CIRA, uh, Canadian Internet Registry Authority, whereby the, the who is information under the .ca has been taken offline. Uh, now, and that's with regards to the uh, the privacy issues uh, that have that, that keep coming up and that we have to struggle with. And mind mind you, the the struggle is is not only with law enforcement; it, it's with everybody. So we have to find ways to to adapt and try different ways of doing it. Um, Certainly from a law enforcement perspective, uh, that was uh, certainly not the best option. Uh, it's not something that we wanted to have, and we know that there's, it, uh, uh, it doesn't bode well for the other law enforcement agencies around the world. However, we have been able to come up with some exceptions, uh, for example, under ch child exploitation, where, whereby we can get access to that information. So those privacy uh, rules are there, and there are the reasons for it. We just have to find ways to adapt and to try to find some ways of, of, of working together, and I think we're well on our way in doing that. All of us who are up here in a federal context have taken some sort of an oath uh, that involves supporting the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of the American people, and that's why we're doing this. And certainly the privacy of those people is a core part uh, of this. Uh, I mean, I've got to tell you the sorts of questions that when I was in the Office of Secretary of Defense, we had to answer when someone lost a laptop, for example, with all sorts of people's names and Social Security numbers. And the question was, what are you doing in your organization to keep that from happening here? Uh, and then in cases when it did happen, it was like, all right, are you willing to subscribe, are you willing to pay for all the people in your uh, employ or under your care for a year's worth of credit checks, for example, in order to make sure, not credit check, credit, credit verification, in order to make sure they weren't disadvantaged for that. This is a daily part of the concern of everything we do, uh, and uh, I'm glad it is. Just, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, first, I just want to support the comments that are made by all my colleagues here. And, and I'm saying, for example, we're standing up a brand new organization, the federal government, and one of the first things we have to do is work on the privacy process and the privacy reviews with all the attorneys to make sure there's an appropriate structure and process in place for handling that. But I, also, I want to talk more broadly about the privacy issue for a moment and anonymity, um, because I think that you know, I was at the Aspen Institute last week at a really amazing session, and we had some of the heroes of the Internet there, like John, you know, Seedley Brown and others, brilliant, brilliant people. And we were talking about this issue of privacy and anonymity, et cetera. And if we look at the traditional privacy debate, people talk about a trade-off between privacy and security and convenience. But a lot of the leading thinkers think there's really not a trade-off between privacy and security if you use appropriate anonymity, but with law enforcement collaboration in the sense that if a warrant is ever delivered or, or subpoena is delivered, the identity of whoever it is, it's, and I see Rich nodding his head, that, who's anonymized is identified. And I actually, I was involved in this, though. The one company I ran in the, in the security sector was called Pravada, and we partnered with, we had an investment from American Express, and an investment from First Data Systems. We raised $37 million, and we pioneered a completely private and anonymous credit card settlement infrastructure uh, uh, between 1999 and 2001. And so you can serve privately, purchase privately, and ship privately and anonymously as long as it was legal. And if it was illegal, if you ever did any illegal activity, then upon delivery of a, of a warrant, then the identity of that individual could be, would, would, would be provided. In fact, it had to be because it was engineered to fully comply with law, uh, with compliance. So you can architect, and we can architect systems that provide, that give tremendous privacy protection, uh, and which also support law enforcement. The issue is a public policy issue and a social issue, which is that I don't think that that's generally understood and the bridge, that, that bridge has not been built. And I think the challenges to the privacy groups 
and the privacy advocates, and there's some very articulate organizations that are here okay, uh, at this event, is for those groups to help propose solutions in the future and open standards that comply with law enforcement and what DOJ, FBI, and others need to do because crimes are real. Cyber crimes are real, and none of us like to get ripped off. So we have to have a secure structure, but we also value our privacy. So I think that the, 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 there's a great opportunity for education and to start changing and move to a new generation of how we understand privacy because we've got to solve this identif identification and authentication issue on the Internet to make the environment more secure. We've got to get on top of this thing because we, I mean, you look at the whole list of things that go on. This is one of the, the core components. So I want to throw the challenge back out to the group here and say we hope that you as a community will be putting together good proposals that the government can consider and the law enforcement bodies that can become active open standards that the private companies will go and go and implement and uh, and make happen. The FBI is we are limited by the same rules, regulations, policies, and procedures as every other agency sitting at this table. If anything, um, privacy is the first thing we have to consider or we do consider when we are requested to accept information or, or share information with someone. Is this a violation of their privacy? How will this be perceived? And it gets lawyered to death before we ever do anything. My, my concern is we have the general public looking at what the government, what information they're providing to the government. And I said, geez, most of the public, they provide more information to utility companies. I don't see them out giving the utility companies, cable company and so forth, a, you know, a hard time. But um, we, the FBI, we have a really tough time when it comes to information sharing doing that with our partners because of the privacy issue but we investigate civil rights violations we certainly have to keep privacy as a consideration when we do our jobs that may not be something that uh, most of you are aware of but it uh, you know, I live with that on a, a daily basis, and when my agents are out, I say, look, you're going to have, you, you need to ask another question when someone says, hey, I have a database of, of, of evildoers, people trying to attack my network. Let me hand this information over to you. And I said, well, first of all, you're going to have to go one step further. Find, ask them how did they come to be in possession of that information. You know, <laughs> They have sensors out there because you would assume they're collecting information from their own network. Well, did they hack a few other networks to acquire that information? Uh, is this information from their own sensors? That is how concerned we are about the privacy. I, you know, I, I would just as soon refuse to accept information than to violate someone's privacy because I don't want to deal with the, the heartache and the grief if it is determined I have information I should not have that uh, is PII, personal identification information, social security number, date of birth, name, you know, address, so forth. So, yeah, it is something we consider quite uh, heavily when we do our jobs now because there are a lot of, there's a lot of information out there, and, and believe it or not, there are a lot of agencies that would like to share that information with us, but I said I'd, I'd rather refuse it than to take something that we shouldn't have and then deal with that. So, uh, yeah, it's something that I, I guess pains me on a daily basis or pains my agents on a daily basis, but we have to take the privacy of our citizens into consideration, and we have to do it very carefully, and it happens on a daily basis, and I haven't seen any major mistakes when it comes to the privacy. Well, I've been there for two years now because I have, um, I've, I've sort of, uh, I, w I won't say intimidated or scared my agents, but I, they, they are thinking about personal liability. And I said, you know, there's always that possibility someone can come after you personally. So keep that in mind when you accept information, when you look at someone's personal information. So my agents are, are, are very conscious of that. So from the FBI, I know it's hard to believe, but it's something that, uh, 
we take into consideration on a daily basis, at least my cyber agents. Twenty-seven of you on this side. Uh, it's always a balance between public safety and privacy, right. like Rod said. And there's nobody up here on the panel that makes the rules. No. We play within the rules that are set by the people that you elect. Right. So if you don't like the rules, vote. Yeah, and I'm, we're not adhering to, say, these aren't FBI policy or privacy rules. These are United States government privacy rules. So... And I have the uh, inspector general who, who comes and looks at uh, how we handle the privacy issues on a regular basis. One last comment, which is if you're living in the United States of America and you're worried about the U.S. government and your privacy, you may be worried about the wrong government Absolutely. or governments. True fact. you have any names? <laughs> hey. Mark says you don't have to worry about the Canadian government. <laughs> I'm sure your agencies, um, in the course of normal day, uh, just doing your jobs, come across a lot of exploits in public domain software. How do you decide which ones you uh, give back out to the public to um, ensure that we can uh, patch ourselves? And how do you decide which ones you keep to yourselves to add to your own arsenal? Well, if NSA gets it, they don't share it with anybody. That's right. So they can exploit it. I think the first thing you need to worry about is a responsible disclosure and detection of, of uh, vulnerabilities uh, as a result of doing vulnerability research, which, of course, we applaud. I think one of the more important steps would be to let the vendor know that there's a problem, work with the vendor to help them correct the problem, and even though I don't work for U.S. CERT, we work very closely with U.S. CERT, and I'm probably stepping on somebody's turf here, but make sure U.S. CERT knows about it as well to help right. correct that issue. You know, that, that is, um, there are processes that, that there are groups, as we speak, that are going through to talk about vulnerability equities and the processes at which those are handled. Um, and those discussions are, are being held at very high levels because that is a, an issue that we have to consider. Because if you think about three bubbles that float out there, um, one is, you know, or two of them are actually folks here at the table, the law enforcement, counterintelligence, and the intel community. But you also have the public and private industry who's not represented at this table. They all have equities. They all have things that they do to do their mission to help do what we do and, you know, to, to protect that intellectual capital. So there is a thin trade-off, uh, a fine trade-off of what you give, what you don't, and what it's used for. Uh, some organizations that discover it probably won't disclose it if it can be used for other, other means. Uh, but it's a, it's a question that has to be asked, and a group has to discuss it, and it has to come to a common decision, and then it has to be handled appropriately based on the risk management piece that I mentioned earlier is what is the mission impact of what we're trying to do. Because from a net defense perspective, my definition of attribution is different than those other three bubbles. And I'm about defending the network, not about handcuffs, not about exploitation or things like that. So we all have our different equities that we have to resolve and get through. So it's got to go through these processes. Uh, and sometimes it's back to the vendors and sometimes it's back to the public domain, uh, depending on what types of categories. But uh, it's a very hard one to answer, but that's one of those things we have to answer on a regular basis. We all know that the, the low-hanging fruit is normally the one that gets picked first. What, if anything, do you guys do to help third parties, like non-government people, protect themselves from an attack from outside of the U.S.? It's all about training and education and about sharing of information. Um, as we are made aware of the issues at hand, uh, and I'll just, you know, use U.S. CERT, we post a lot of information and not just off the U.S off the U.S. CERT uh, websites. Uh, there are other websites that uh, U.S. CERT uses on, uh, for training and education of uh, uh, the public 
to talk about. There's other there's other sites that uh, you know. Uh, I'll I'll pick on Mr. Uh, Leather Jacket over there, one of the organizations he supports uh, uh, with Sands. They produce a lot of stuff. Uh, Carnegie Mellon and Cert CC. There's a lot of information out there, uh, and you know, between us and and Cert CC and others, we try to consolidate that to help educate the users, those that are willing to take the time to look and hopefully implement it in their systems at home even. Uh, so that, that information is out there and available, and it's, it's shared as freely as it can be. Uh, a couple of things you may not be aware of. You can go to our website and download uh, some very instructive guidance on uh, how to set up your computers, you know, a configuration guidance. And this was done in conjunction with vendors done in conjunction with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and that's readily available for anyone who wants to download it from the Internet. We take education very seriously, so seriously that in cooperation now with the Department of Homeland Security since they've been established, we get a lot of money from Congress, not as, not as enough as we think we need, but a sufficient amount to support a number of schools. There are 73 schools across the country now that have been identified as uh, centers of academic excellence and information assurance. And many of these schools are not necessarily the top tier schools like your MIT, uh, Stanford, et cetera. A lot of them, uh, several of them are community colleges. And you might ask yourself, why in the world are you spending money training people at community colleges in some isolated portion of the United States, Northwest uh, Nebraska, for example? Well, the idea is to spread that knowledge because the home users need it just as much as big government and just as much as big big industry. Uh, the the, uh, the crux of the question is what does the government do to, to give back to the community as far as feeding back uh, uh, you know, exploits and whatnot? And I think you've got to keep in mind that, it, it, speaking for NASA, it, we, we have a lot of contractors. I mean, it's, it's private industry that drives NASA. I mean, it's the, those are the contracts that that, that, uh, that keep our work going, and uh, it behooves us to get the word out on these things. I don't, I, I don't want a, a NASA contractor or a DOD contractor any more vulnerable than a NASA system, because that's, a lot of times it's NASA data on there. Uh, we, need, we need the private sector secure so that we can be secure, because they're doing a lot of the work for us. A large... A good percentage of our investigations, our joint investigations, worked with our international law enforcement partners. Uh, as you may know or suspect, a lot of our pain comes from outside the borders of the U.S. I have cases I work with Russia, China, Eastern Europe. I have a task force in Romania. Uh, so I am... I am doing what I believe is, is an absolute must in terms of working globally with our international partners. There was a time when people believed if it originated, if an attack originated from outside of our borders, then it was beyond our reach. Well, that's not the case because they are being plagued by the same thing, and the Internet works the same for them. So they are what I consider, they're motivated to cooperate. Now, will their laws, will the sentences their, their citizens receive be similar to those in the U.S.? Some cases, yes. Some cases, no. Um, a good example is a kill. Uh, uh, we saw what happened in, in that case, but we worked, we worked that case jointly. But uh, that's one of the things we have to do, work with our, our law enforcement partners in an internationally. I spend a lot of time training our international law enforcement partners, a lot of time looking at their networks and helping them shore up their networks because they are working with, in some cases, inferior equipment and uh, the skills aren't quite up to the level they should be. But I figure if uh, we help them improve their situation, we may see them handle a lot more on their end instead of it making it to the U.S. So that's my part, and I spend a lot of time on the road, and that's both with counterfeit intellectual property violations as well as intrusions. So that's where the FBI stands in terms of 
protecting its citizens from those, those attacks from abroad. Just very quickly, um, the NSA is the NASA of cyberspace. It is the greatest uh, a focal point of federal research dollars. In the same way, NASA has developed incredible technologies that helped shape the whole semiconductor industry and, and many others uh, into our scientific advancement. NSA is phenomenal investment in science and technology and resources. Let's talk about how that's helped consumers as well as small businesses. If you open the VISTA operating system, you look at the documentation in the manual, on the front of that manual, you'll see a tribute and a thank you to NSA for tightening up and improving the quality and security of that product. Uh, in the same fashion, they partner with Apple. So you do see a big spillover benefit of that core R&D effort being done uh, going directly into the private sector. Checks in the email. <laughs> so um, you guys talked about always wanting people like us in this room is for hires, and obviously the industry is growing. <laughs> okay, well, then. no, but um, I'll be one of several hundred thousand college graduates next year across the U.S. and across the globe. How do I get maybe my resume or get in contact with you people? Because your recruiting websites, mm, they really aren't that great. I can't say I've looked at all of them, but, um, you know, what's the best way to find passionate people like us and kind of make it past the, the cannon fodder, so to speak? Um, Networking. And I'm not talking about computer networking. <laughs> Uh, see, see have, any of oh, us and get a business card uh, before you leave. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, every every DEF CON, we come here and uh, get literally dozens of uh, applications. And for DC3, Defense Cyber Crime Center, we have, uh, we're have we about 75% contractors. So the hiring is pretty e – hey, hey. <laughs> Equal opportunity it's recruiting pretty easy. here. You know, getting into government takes a while. So a lot of our guys uh, come in as a contractor first and then apply for the government position later. Uh, real quick, one of, one of the websites, I know you go to each, um, each agency's website, but, and I'm just saying this, this may be one of the crappy websites you're talking about, is usajobs.com. There's a lot of, all the jobs, we, that's where we get our postings from. We, we post our jobs to usajobs.com, and that's where we hire from uh, most of the time. Um, but the, the other thing is, like, like somebody said, networking. Uh, people that hand me a resume, I will... I will interface with them if, if it's somebody that, that I think is worthwhile. I'll interface with them when we do put a posting up and make sure that they know that it's up there and, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can. So am I to understand that Vista is the NSA's fault? Is that what happened? <laughs> I was thinking out loud, my mistake. Um, anyway, uh, a few of you had discussed that um, some of your primary goals, uh, some of your primary jobs are taken up by monitoring network intrusion throughout the day and uh, you know resources that aren't as uh, high as you'd like them to be. In the future, integrated chips will all be built with grid computing in mind, and eventually there's going to be, you know, every system is available on the planet. Uh, what will be done to make sure that you guys are prepared for that adequately? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. <laughs> so send research dollars. Yeah. I'll see you there. In that answer to that question, y'all are the rocket scientists. Y'all help solve the problem. Uh, this is one for the military guys. Um, there, there are the obvious, you know, tasks of, of, um, you know. Figuring out how to how to face off against you know the the Chinese information warfare regiments and defending the the fixed networks here in the UK. But uh, one of the one of the possibly the most dangerous I guess threats comes from uh, deployed operations. You know if you war drive around places like Camp Phoenix in Kabul and uh, uh, you know around Kandahar, which which I have done, you you can pick up um, you know wireless networks that have been operated both by by the actual troops on the ground there, whether in an official capacity or, or privately, running games and stuff, and also by the contractors. How do you guys, um, you know, deal with that threat? What sort of policies, what sort of measures do you have in place to, to, to kind of prevent um, information leaking out and, you know, the bad guys sitting on a hill three miles away with a, with a Pringles can 
intercepting the information on when the, ne when the next convoy is going to be going out. Well, um, we do have programs in place for that, of course. Um, there's spot checking, of course. We have people running around with, with, uh, with checkers. We scan our networks, our deployed networks, certainly our military ones. As far as private ones go, in many cases, those, those pieces of equipment aren't permitted in those countries any, anyhow because they don't meet standards for those, for those countries for radiation of uh, radio RF energy. So, uh, so there's other impetuses to, to prevent those things from being stood up as well. Um, but um, but f fundamentally, um, the, the risk to those things are, are handled in a, in a number of ways, uh, aside from those checks, um, including you know inspections of, of gear and items that are that are going to the uh, area of responsibility, the the, the war zones. Um, there are confiscations if you're caught with such equipment. Those things are simply taken from the sol uh, from the soldiers and are not returned. Um, uh, so there, there's, when they do those things, those are a pretty good risk to their own personal purse as well as, uh, and, and they know that. Uh, but if you were sitting in the desert for uh, 18 months, you'd be pretty bored too in some cases. Um, so uh, some of those things are understandable to the extent that they don't connect to DOD networks. You know, they're recreational, like you said, for gaming or something. Um, we're less concerned about that from a security standpoint, but we still have a responsibility to those other countries uh, to not allow gear uh, that doesn't meet their laws uh, into the country either. So it's so it's kind of an international affairs problem um, when we when our folks show up with those things, and it's a security problem if they're connected to the DoD network, and we have measures in place to hand you know to to handle those things. Um, I can't say that it doesn't happen. It, cer it certainly does, um, but it's mopped up pretty good, and the penalties are pretty severe, actually, for it. Uh, you're prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice for, for, for those violations, and so I think the soldiers are beginning to take it more seriously, soldiers and airmen, of course, from my point of view. Uh, so that's about all. I have a, a remark and a question. One, I'm former U.S. Air Force Electronic Warfare 53rd Wing, which I believe is now under your cyber command. Uh, you made a remark earlier that the botnet was beneath you. In electronic warfare, we had a motto, and God we trust all others we monitor, jam, and deceive. And if we can't do that, we drop a bomb on them. So the fact is, is if you remove things from your arsenal and you're, and you're fighting this war, how do you plan uh, to win the war? whenever there is no rules of engagement. And for the gentleman on the end, any system that is architected anonymous that you can provide the details of an individual operating in that system by default is not an anonymous system, so. Right, well, um, the, what I was really trying to say when we were talking about the botnet was in essence that there are better ways of doing what we need to do rather than use a botnet. Um, and if uh, given the choice and a fixed budget, you know, I have to be responsible with my budget. Uh, I don't think uh, I want to take more money from the Treasury than I absolutely need to uh, to do the job. There are much more effective weapons uh, that you could pursue rather than a botnet. Far more effective. I just want to res uh, respond to your comment. You know, uh, obviously there's a school of thought out there that says anything that's connected to the network can be hacked. And if that's true, there is no privacy for anyone, anywhere, anytime. So, and, uh, so for those who are going to hold that uh, position that I'm not going to argue with, okay, that may be a point, and the only privacy we gain may be through legal means. But I think that um, then we have to figure out where are we going to go with this debate then. I mean, if, if what you're saying is there's no privacy whatsoever, then we have to go to McNeely's model, right, which he says get over it, right? You have no privacy, get over it is Scott McNeely's motto. So anyway, I'm sympathetic to your comments. I don't, you know, there's a body of hackers who would say anything that's connected can be hacked. 
and I'm open to listening to that debate. I want to come back actually to the grid computing thing real quickly because we didn't respond to that. You know, c cloud computing is becoming huge, okay, and hosted services are becoming huge across the network. It's a structural shift, one of the greatest structural shifts we're going to see in whether you want to call it services outsourcing or application outsourcing. I actually, I don't know, I just have this intuitive sense that there might be some greater security opportunities for us in that from the government's perspective because the government, you think of the United States government perhaps as being this huge centralized thing. Okay. In fact, it's massively decentralized. Okay. There's not only 12 departments. There's countless agencies, tons of components and offices. There's thousands of things going on out there in the government. And, you know, not every group is going to have the same level of sophistication in securing, in securing their information assets and their networks. Hosted services that are run by world-class companies with, with tens of billions of dollars of market cap and a lot of liability on information security in some cases may be, doing, may be able to do a better job of that than a small office in some service. So, I'm sorry? What liability? Well, like this, the, like the, like the, like the payment TJ Maxx just made on the credit cards, right? Do you saw a fifty million dollar payment? I call that liability. So there, there is liability. Now you can argue, by the way, and there's an interesting policy discussion of whether there should be more liability. What should be the liability uh, that various parties have in the system? And would changing those economic structures lead to more of the behaviors that we want to see in terms of protection? So just wanted to touch on that. that. Thank you. You guys are the security experts for computers for our government. What are, is uh, your department doing to educate the rest of the government on uh, unsecure systems such as e-voting, for instance? Uh, w do you talk with Congress and educate them that we shouldn't be using these systems since they're clearly not secure? Well, let me start with that. We had uh, about uh, 10 uh, congressional staffers, both from uh, Congress and the uh, Senate, uh, at our facility this week trying to educate folks and uh, prioritize uh, limited resources where they need to go and what regulations, what doesn't need to be regulated, et cetera. So, anybody else? Uh, about a year ago, I had the privilege of uh, actually going up to the Hill with Rich uh, for a number of times on a weekly basis, multiple times a week, and actually educating um, and uh, bringing up to speed a lot of our congressmen and senators literally one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and again, that's really kind of what we're doing is trying to get there and educating them, not so much on the voting system standpoint from that, from that, but to ensure that they're aware of things that are happening in the cyber realm. Uh, across the federal government, across the nation from that standpoint. So again, that was something we did for a little over a year while I was still uh, there, and it's probably still going on today. Last week, I sat as a backbencher uh, to listen to the House staff and the Senate staff, their security staffs, brief a large number of members of Congress, both representatives and senators. Their biggest concern is privacy, not just the privacy of their constituents, because they get overwhelmed with that kind of complaint all of the time. But it's interesting how they communicate with their constituents. It's not done via mail anymore because of the anthrax scare. Every member of Congress, regardless of their age, carries and uses a BlackBerry, and that's not an implied endorsement or an express endorsement, but they use a PDA. They know the vulnerabilities associated with using wireless nets, they're very concerned about that, and they're very concerned about the security of their systems that are operated in their office by them and also by their staffers. They view threats in a very interesting way. They want to make sure that their adversaries, which is the member of the other political party, is not hacking into their systems. They're very concerned about their security and their privacy for themselves and also for their constituents. I would turn that around on you guys and uh, challenge you. We're, in, we're we're at a critical time right now. You have two candidates, and what do you know about um, uh, their cyber security initiatives? And you should be asking those questions and and raising raising their awareness to this that it's important. And they and whoever wins needs to address this. Well, since the uh, subject of security clearances came up a few times earlier, uh, do any of you believe that the current restrictions 
you know, involved in getting a security clearance are not useful for, not always useful for the threat matrix that you're facing and that you're looking for in your employees. Are some of them outmoded for what you uh, are looking for? Have you felt that that's impacted your hiring process? And also, how is TSA going to deal with all of these coming into bags at the airport on Sunday? <laughs> Sir, are you implying that those uh, restrictions should be um, loosened a little in terms I'm, of? I'm saying that. Are these res I'm your restrictions I'm or? I'm asking you whether you believe that um, just a blanket, have you engaged in felonious behavior, uh, does that map to the threats that you would be facing on whether an employee is loyal, et cetera? Well, uh, post. 9-11-2001, I think those, those questions are probably more appropriate and, uh, and probably map better to the threat matrix. We have, to be, uh, we have to be just a tad bit more careful, and I expect those, those limitations or restrictions to tighten as opposed to loosen. At least that's what I've seen. And there's a reason for that. It's called national security. I don't believe we can go the other direction and actually be effective in providing a higher level of security for you and the rest of our general public by loosening those restrictions. So um, I, I, I think they still map well to the threat matrix. I, and I, I, yeah, I think the the questionnaire, the you know, the, the certainly the uh, subject questionnaire that you might be referring to is uh, uh, it, it's been that way for a while, but I think it's pretty comprehensive. Um, also, it, it certainly isn't the be all end all of the investigation. It's just the subject's input, right? I mean, we call it an, a background investigation for a reason because we're going to take. It, it's actually one of the last things that's uh, that's actually. Uh, uh, reattested to, you know, in the process. You know, an agent comes to see you toward the end of the period of investigation after they know and have investigated you and asks you those questions directly and has you sign affidavits and whatnot. So um, the purpose of that, those questions are, are not necessarily to be the whole of the investigation, obviously. So, I, I, but I do think it's a point of departure. But, sir, uh, for I... Them. I I can tell you where it's had it's had differences, cultural differences when it comes to polygraphs. Um, it has it has caused problems for us in terms of recruiting certain people. Um, certain questions based on cultural differences, um, we have found that that uh, causes us to what I consider miss out on uh, a lot of good recruits. But a lot of research went into developing those questions for the background investigations, the polygraphs. So I know we are, we are missing out on, on recruiting people from certain cultures or recruiting people from certain occupations. It happens, and uh, it's uh, an acceptable loss at this point. It's a trade-off. I think value set counts, not just expertise right. and how good you are and what you know, but values count as well. Yes, um, we've heard from this panel a lot about kind of the outreach and the leadership in cybersecurity, and that's, that's great. Are you finding that in the convergence of logical and physical security, are you able to influence your counterparts in the physical security world to adopt secure policies and practices and not do stupid things? No, I think that's in their job description. <laughs> stupid things sometimes. Well, that was one of the re yeah, that was one of the requirements when I uh, set out to uh, depart from my current position because I'm eligible to retire. I said I will not talk to a company where physical security and information security are under separate umbrellas. I have the physical people reporting to HR and the you know information security reporting to IT. I, I don't believe that is the best model. My personal impression. So, when I'm talking to my colleagues because many of my colleagues have left and gone to the private sector, and they're 
on their physical security side. I, I am more an information security guy. However, I believe the, the best operational model is where, where all security is under one umbrella. And I have actually talked to a lot of our private sector partners in InfraGuard and a lot of our private sector partners and a couple of the other public-private alliances we have about considering that model. Uh, because I, I don't believe we can be as effective with one over here reporting to HR and so forth. So, and a lot of them have come about, come around to that. However, I also have noticed some of them have tried it and gone back to that separate, separate physical and information security model. Why I don't know. I, I'm still unsure as to why it's not being attempted more. Uh, for our IRS, our physical security uh, operation center and our cybersecurity operation center is actually co-located uh, together so they can work together as one team. I'd like to first direct this to the RCMP, to my fellow Canadian, and then to the FBI. But I've, I've, oh, some more. I've noticed a trend over globally towards uh, ubiquitous surveillance. So if you see it at the Beijing Olympics, there's cameras everywhere in London, England. I think New York is trying to implement something like this. And I'm wondering, is it possible to have effective oversight with just enforcement having access to, the, to these systems? So you, you've, there have been examples in London, for instance, of people peeping in through people's windows. So I'm wondering, who watches the watchers, and how do you effectively control the balance of power, then, between enforcement and the regular people? Would you consider opening up the systems to everybody? Who watches over us, obviously, are the laws. Uh, whenever uh, we get, uh, whether it's the warrants uh, for surveillance and then those types of things, we have the, uh, the courts to answer to. So it's not just done haphazardly. Uh, we don't have the video surveillance systems that other countries do. I think the uh, UK is probably the most well, advanced in, in, the, in how they have it. They have cameras virtually everywhere. It comes back to what we had mentioned before. It's weighing between uh, you know, the privacy issues of a country, uh, what they are willing to, to bear, and the laws that they have. And also that comes from the public uh, outcry as well. Are they willing to do this or not? Are they willing to accept it? You'll find that I think in some of the countries, uh, again, in London is a good example, with all of the cameras that are available there, I think the public feels perhaps more safe. Now, if that were to be done in uh, some cities here in uh, the States or in Canada, I could guarantee you in Canada, at least in some of the cities, uh, you know, there would be a, a huge public outcry and they would say, no, we don't want that. But from a police perspective, any, any of the ones, any of the things that we do, certainly we're accountable to the courts. And, and I think that holds true to probably the states here and uh, any other country. Uh, some other countries are maybe not as advanced, but uh, whenever uh, you get something, a court order, for example, that has to be answered to before the courts. <laughs> why, people, why people believe, our public believes, we... Uh, we will abuse those authorities. Let me tell you, I've interviewed too many people in prison to ever want to be in their place. <laughs> so a court-authorized court authorized monitoring, court-authorized wiretap, you know, overstepping those bounds is not something that uh, any of, any of our, our agencies, uh, and we probably do more of them on the criminal side and we probably do more of them than anyone at this table will admit to. You know, I'm sure there are more done elsewhere, but I, um, as long as it's court ordered, I have no problems with it. And I don't believe those powers, those authorities are being abused because there are too many checks and balances. How many years ago is that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, see, you know, things have gotten better. But I, I, I didn't say it has not happened. You will always find instances where someone has tried to sidestep the rules or overstep their, the authorities. We lock up our own. I've interviewed former FBI agents in prison. 
not a, not a uh, comfortable feeling, but I have done it because I spent two years in what's considered our internal affairs. And so I don't ever want to be on the other side, and most law enforcement or national security people want to be on the other side where they, where the door, the cell goes shut and they can't walk out the front gates. So uh, opening it up to everyone, as you say, I think that's ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, you know, talking about an invasion of privacy, I'm not sure how we would how we would work that. But um, no, I, I I have no problems with it as long as it's court authorized. I don't believe those powers are being abused. So, again, nobody nobody on this panel, their agencies don't make the rules. Right. You guys make the rules by voting and in influencing uh, 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 your politicians. But you know. If if these guys weren't using the tools available to protect you, you'd really be fucking pissed. You know? Right. Um, yeah, what, what do you think is the role of government uh, in trust? And what I mean by that is uh, uh, the population of this country and everywhere in the world really is using all these devices, uh, commercial devices, in public places like ATMs. So uh, there are reports that people install readers on ATMs to collect information, but the ATMs may be buggered to start with. Do you think the government has a role to, to play there, like maybe some kind of a trust? I'm thinking of this because, like, we have an FDA, right? And they sort of test drugs and they say, okay, this is not ready for production, right? Is, is there any thought to that or shouldn't we go on? Uh, what's your thoughts? So you're basically asking about uh, uh, regulation? Okay, show of hands, how many of you think the government ought to regulate cybersecurity in the private sector and in your personal life? Turn around and look. Uh -huh. That's your answer. They don't want it. Congress didn't pass any laws to do that. Hi, I've got a question about the continued suppression of UFO Takes one to know one. <laughs> I got a tinfoil hat for you. you. You stood in line that long to say that? <laughs> got a good laugh. Um, I have a two-part question. The first part is uh, directed at our military people, and the second part is for um, law enforcement. Uh, and uh, the question is this. Uh, for, you guys were talking about for private institutions, how do we protect them? How does the government help protect them? And uh, you guys em emphasized education. Um, I, the way I think about it, the analogy I like to think about it is like, well, okay, you can educate someone in, in the real world, for example, put locks on your doors. That'll protect you from your average thief, even a medica lock. Um, but, but the question is, what about when the attacks are not so much like an average thief, but more like a missile launch? Like, for example, denial of service, um, denial of service attacks from organized crime, be it from nation states or from um, private criminal enterprises. So what is there, what does the military do? Because, I mean, like, you know, in the real world we have, uh, in the non-cyber world, let's say, we have airplanes and other defense systems. So what do we do on the cyber front to improve our inf infrastructure and defensive capabilities to protect um, when education isn't enough? That's my question towards military and on the law enforcement front, because I'm sure law enforcement... That's all the question. Black hole, black hole the packets. <laughs> Is that, is that right? Because this is actually part of this. Uh, I'm sure law enforcement is a big part of this, of stopping this problem. And um, what can you guys do about the guys like, I, I saw this program, this, uh, To Catch a Predator, but not that one, but the one they did on the cyber thing. I forgot what it was called. Um, and he, John Hansen, found this scamming guy really easily, and it was sick. He just walked out, and it was really gross to watch. And um, I, was saying, I was thinking to myself, wow, if he can find this guy so easily, why can't we protect our own citizens from scammers like that? 
Okay, uh, question one, I guess we'll, we'll start off with. As far as uh, protecting the general public from, well, first of all, there, there's a division between the people here up on this stage and, 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 and it, you know, between all the different agencies here. Obviously, I'm, I'm the military side, but in order to qualify as a military activity, it really has to be done by another nation state. Or go against, um, or, or go against something that the, that, that the president declares, you know, a, a threat, a, a national threat uh, to to our or to our capabilities that way. So, in, in a way, there's a lot of. Uh, it, it's not entirely clear all the time where an attack is coming from. Obviously, with a, with a botnet, let's say, take take for example. So, uh, you know, for, first problem is going to be attribution, you know, in that case. So I mean, if if, a, if another nation were shown to be uh, were, were uh, attributed to an, a particular attack uh, against, say, the U.S. military or against the nation in general, say some of our major infrastructure, you know, then we uh, U.S. certain we and others would be having a conversation about, you know, what what, what do we recommend to senior leadership within the within the uh, within the U.S. not just the U.S. military. Um, to, to handle that threat, uh, the answer to that may be, you know, the the military mounts, you know, a counterattack, um, and that attack can take many forms. It could it could be an electronic counterattack. It might be a kinetic attack, and that's and that's that's something that uh, the United States Air Force. That's why we're in this business. Uh, that's why the Air Force is in this business because we do bring to the table a, a set of integrated effects. Across global integrated effects across the spectrum of conflict, so um, so that that's that's really kind of our our, our view of, of that situation. So it, attributions required, um, and then a discussion about national level options um, between the non-military parts of the U.S. government and 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 the military parts of the government going together to senior leadership to determine a way ahead. But uh, I'd like the U.S. CERT to talk about that a little bit, too, from his perspective. We have two things that we, we follow. The, the main one is the National Response Plan, and, and it covers a lot of different activities on how we handle certain types of activities. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're talking to some type of response action, uh, that's when it starts getting beyond what we can probably discuss in this room. Plus, uh, you know, it, it's it's a very difficult trigger to pull because of the attribution piece. We don't see the the, the muzzle flash, the the smoking gun. But to to uh, expand this discussion, there's the uh, National uh, Cyber Response Coordination Group. Uh, still learning some things that it needs to do, but uh, it brings. The, the government to include the uh, Department of Justice. So we've got the guys over there. It brings uh, the DOD, so that includes both military as well as uh, other groups at the table, and as well as uh, Department of Homeland Security. So it's a very uh, comprehensive process to determine what we can do, one, from a defensive mitigation strategy, and is there something that should be recommended to the president uh, to do because you've got to get to that point of saying this is an act of war or act of something that is severe enough that the politicians are willing to uh, put something out on the line like that. Just real quick on the, the second part of your question was uh, the, the press guy who was able to um, find the, the scammer real quick and all. It, that's a question that comes up a lot. It's a frustration of a lot of citizens. Two answers to that real quick. Number one is volume. There's just there's a lot of them out there doing this stuff and we have a certain threshold um, people that, that we're going to go after that sort of the volume is up on. And, and the other thing is, and it goes back to the privacy question, is they're using different tools than we are. You know, they're, they're not worried about the same constitutional rights violations that we are. Catching somebody for us is a little bit more difficult because I don't have the journalist tools. I have law enforcement tools with regard to finding people, tracking people. You know what I mean? It's, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, that question's come up a lot. Uh, uh, one of the uh, analogies is like drug deals. You, you find why is it so easy for a 10-year-old kid to buy a, a rock of crack on the street, and but cops can't catch them? Volume, there's a lot of it going on, 
and catching them takes a lot more than just knowledge of the neighborhood and you have to have people talking to you it's, it's the techniques you use to get it so I just want to say that real quick I'm sorry but we only have uh, time for one more question so the rest of you guys can sit down I apologize these guys will hang around afterwards though so the uh, <laughs> pressure no pressure no pressure <laughs> So the, uh, the the typical office software, and including at, down at the operating system level and at the higher level, with things like IE and Outlook and Word and all, have this uh, years, many many years long track record of being just absolutely dreadful for security. And uh, here you are supposedly caring about security, but I gather that you tend to run a lot of this software, uh, despite having some alternatives even developed by the NSA uh, for compartmentalizing things a bit better. Um, what about moving away from some of this um, stuff with a very obvious, long, defective record and, and not moving away from this? Is, isn't this basically just asking to have yourself hacked into? Forget that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just come right out and tell you. You know, uh, just like Jim's told you before, you, you get that government that you elect, right? So we have to follow rules uh, laid down for procurement of pieces of software that the politicians that you elect uh, put into place. I didn't elect Windows. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you elect the guys uh, in the Congress that require certain levels of competition um, you know, for large bids for software. And so sometimes those competitions um, are based uh, on they are, they are based on many factors, but cost is a major factor in some some cases, and it, and, and verifiability is also another issue too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so shoot back on that one. But, uh, but at any rate, so that, that's part part of the answer. Uh, it, it's a and at, we don't mean to reflect all those sorts of questions back, you know, on your elected officials. But 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 that is a major issue with uh, with our procurement. That that's why we sometimes get the things that we get. Okay, I'd like to thank first off you guys for uh, the thoughtful questions, uh, except for you, Neil. <laughs> and, and thanks for the panel for uh, uh, you know putting yourself out uh, at risk like this. Thank you.